So let's talk about Daniel Dennett. Dr. Dennett is the Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University, as well as their co-director of the Center for Cognitive Studies. He's the author of a number of books popularizing evolution, cognitive science, memes, and philosophy, including Consciousness Explained, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and Intuition Pumps. We recently had the chance to talk with him about his thoughts on language, and we're excited to share them with you. Let's see what he had to say. So thank you for joining us. I'm happy to join you, Morty. Right, thank you. So you've talked in the past about the McCready explosion, which is this change over the past 10,000 years of, for people and the domesticated animals that they're associated with to move from 0.1% of sort of the land vertebrate biomass to about 98%. And you've implicated language as playing a major role yeah. in that. So you're wondering if you would um, talk about the role that you think language has played in this. Well, I, I think that language over much more than 10,000 years, mm -hmm. but blossoming in the last 10,000 years, uh, has made human minds so different from all other minds on the planet mm -hmm. that uh, um, it's hard even to know how to, how to measure the differences. Mm -hmm. They're so great. Uh, and the main thing, the main feature of it is it's permitted us to share our knowledge mm -hmm. and to share our expertise. Um, the smartest chimpanzee that ever uh, prowled the, the uh, uh, forest uh, never gets to uh, benefit from what it, its peers and ancestors learned. Mm -hmm. uh, this, it's, it's a de novo for each chimpanzee, really, right. with mm -hmm. almost no exceptions. Whereas we grow up uh, imbibing uh, the uh, fruits of earlier people's explorations uh, at an just astonishing rate, and that's what gives us the minds that we have. Right. So a lot of the stuff for things that were just these huge landmark discoveries that people have made in the past that were just like, oh, only the most expert people ever would know about this now. It's available to a lot lower level, uh, lower yes, knowledge. Yes, and in fact, many of the things that we think of as the products of expertise, in fact, are not. Mm -hmm. I think they themselves evolved culturally. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody, uh, nobody, nobody invented the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, the wheel evolved over time from rollers and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so nobody gets credit to be the person. You can reinvent the wheel, but you yeah. can't be the inventor. <laughs> okay. um, and that's just one of a, a, a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million cases where mm -hmm. Um, culturally transmitted know-how, competence, or just the fruits thereof mm -hmm. gets uh, spread around the globe, everybody benefits. Right. I want to ask you um, what you think um, philosophers and linguists should be trying to learn from each other now? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been uh, doing my bit. Um, first of all, I think that um, the uh, the Chomskyan disdain for evolution mm -hmm. uh, is a lamentable uh, trend, which we have to reverse. Okay. And Steve Pinker has done a good job. Uh, my colleague Ray Jackendoff has done a good job. Mm -hmm. I'm putting in my oar pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that When you look at language through the lens of evolution, features that look either baffling or stupendous mm. um, are, are sort of seen in a different light, and mm -hmm. in a good light. I think it's very useful to think of languages as evolved, mm -hmm. They're brilliantly designed, but not by us. Okay. They are culturally evolved uh, systems that many of whose features depend on the history of evolution of those very features. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're beginning to get some interesting books by people like Derek Bickerton and Lieberman and Tomasello. That and Lieberman is not me, by the way, yes, just to be yes. clear. <laughs> there's, what, three or four Yeah, Liebermans. there's unfortunate number of Liebermans out there. Yeah, yeah. it's a popular field <laughs> yeah. for, for Lieberman. Yeah. I think that 
approaches to um, the evolution of language and, and to the evolution of lexical items of words mm -hmm. uh, is going to bear fruit. At least I hope it is, because my next book full of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's how you see linguistics sort of playing back into philosophy as well. Yes, and um, philosophy of language mm -hmm. has had in this same half century period um, a sort of checkered career too. Mm -hmm. Very, very influential within analytic philosophy mm -hmm. um, uh, with uh, great landmark figures like Quine and mm -hmm. Grice. Yeah. Uh, Strassen and Putnam and uh, our second video uh, was about Grace and you know. Austin mm -hmm. uh, um, and so there's been more traffic between those philosophers and their many followers and critics and expositors and the linguists mm -hmm. um, than with I think with any other area in philosophy um, and some of those philosophers are actually quite good trained linguists. Mm -hmm. uh, they sometimes even have joint appointments. Mm -hmm. um, that's true. I don't think that's always been a good thing. Okay. Because I think it has encouraged philosophy of language to narrow itself down mm -hmm. and to uh, ignore topics which quite properly or philosophical, uh, but we're Can you uh, give sort us of a, on the taboo list if you were going to be a good Chomskyan. Well, again, evolution. Yeah. Okay. But, but I'm happy to say that um, uh, uh, David Kaplan, mm -hmm. philosopher of language, uh, uh, had a paper, I can't think of the title of it right now, which explored uh, sort of the evolution of words. Mm -hmm. Words as descendants of their, of other words and of other tokens, right. <laughs> and uh, uh, my former colleague Mark Richard, now at Harvard, has a, a book in progress on on that, looking at mm -hmm. at um, uh, meanings of species, and uh, it encounters a lot of. Noisy, but I think empty resistance, mm. and it will be very interesting to see where that goes. Yeah. And of course, there are many in linguistics mm -hmm. who say it's not going to go anywhere. We'll <laughs> just wait; it'll well, blow over. But that's, I, that's you right. know, that's, that's what the, way, the, that's what the yeah. cutting edge always looks like. Yeah. So back about 20 years ago or so now, you um, wrote a review of Steven Pinker's The Language Instinct. Mm -hmm. And in that, you said that you felt that the gap between the people who are sort of studying language for a living and um, the general populace might be closing. We were wondering whether you feel the same now. Has it changed over that time? Are we doing better? I think so. I think the, I think the, the sort of caricature, self-caricature age of linguistics mm -hmm. is over. Um, I'm glad uh, you. <laughs> not that there aren't departments that are uh, sort of deeply embattled and and you know f in their fortresses, mm -hmm. uh, but okay, so they're in their fortresses and. Uh, the news will get out to them someday that, mm -hmm. that <laughs> they can come out and yeah. join the rest of the world. Um, it's I nice think, out here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think I think that the uh, and I think Steve Pinker's book uh, uh, had a lot to do with that. So um, you've written pretty recently, actually, about the connections between syntax and semantics, and also sort of connecting into computers. Um, and it seems like from those writings that you don't think that there's um, any barriers to having computers really use language in a human kind of way. So we we're wondering if you could talk about that a bit for us. Uh, the barriers that exist are um, monetary. Mm -hmm. There's some technical barriers, but I think no, nothing else. Okay. Um, if you look at, um, let's look at, at what everybody's excited about today, and that's deep learning, mm -hmm. and things like Google Translate, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the so-called semantic web. Uh, uh, unbelievable progress over a very short period of time in those areas. Right. Caught a lot of people flat-footed. And... Uh, uh, somebody has quoted recently uh, uh, an executive for, I think, Google, 
who said, every time I fire a linguist, our, our speed goes mm -hmm. up 10% or something this like is that. A, Tinker mentioned this in his interview, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a very it's, it's catchy a, quote. It's a yeah. catchy quote. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, the word on the street, then, is throw away all that syntax and parsing and all that and just use brute force deep learning and you'll and you can you can suck all the semantics you need out of the corpus this huge corpus on the internet and and get highly reliable robust translation for instance and uh, interpretation within a language so that you're going to be able to get understanding um, Do you and think I that's think I think we have to take the the claim very seriously. Um, Pedro uh, Domingos's new book, mm -hmm. The Master Algorithm, is a little bit over the top, but it's pretty good on this, and he makes mm -hmm. a strong case. What I think should should always be stressed is that deep learning systems of this sort uh, uh, stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. For instance, Google Translate depends on all the human translators that have gone before it. What it does is it, it sucks up millions of pages of good translation. Mm -hmm. How do we know it's good? Well, it's good enough to put on the internet. It's, mm -hmm. it's good enough to pay people to do. So, so you've got this high quality translation that's already been done and you just, you just this is sort of high quality plagiarism. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's very evolutionary. You know, right. if it works, copy it. Uh, and so what we're seeing is the bottom-up Darwinian style reuse of design again and again and again and again, right. and they're getting much, much better at it. Mm -hmm. Now, does that take us all the way to human comprehension? It takes us all the way to something that's very close to human comprehension because I think a lot of human comprehension, that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. Kids growing up, they hear all this language, they're, they're soaking up a lot and they're not parsing it and they're not, not yet they're not, they're, they're just seeing, they're, they're seeing just what Google Translate sees. They're, they're seeing statistical patterns unconsciously which gradually uh, uh, crystallize, if you like, into uh, a competence with language where they, do they know the meanings of the words? They know the meanings of words the way uh, latent semantic analysis knows the meanings of words, the way, the way Tom Landauer's uh, work does. It's, uh, it can pass a vocabulary test. So um, I'm just curious, so there's been research over the past, um, say, 10 years or so, um, looking at statistical learning within kids and kind of finding that for the data that kids have, um, it doesn't seem like they're necessarily able to get to the point where um, they know what we know that they know from doing sort of acquisition research without some sort of background knowledge about how language can work. So that's sort of like universal oh, grammar. Oh, yeah, idea. I mean, uh, uh uh, the, the kid's brain is not a is not a tabular mm -hmm. It's not a blank slate. Of course not. Um, and uh, what a good evolutionist would say is, the line between learning and evolution is blurry and porous. And gradually, things that were originally had to be learned by individuals get moved into the genome mm -hmm. by the Baldwin effect. And so we don't know how much of the uh, earlier experience of the species with language has shaped our brains for language. What we know is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Chomsky has never, has always discouraged looking at that process mm -hmm. uh, and has had some fantasies about, about what kind of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, monstrous leap to language it might be. And I think, I think that's, that's to be just simply discarded. That's not serious. Okay. Uh, 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 of course, language evolved to fit the brain. 
And then the brain evolved to fit language. All right. And, and it's a co-evolutionary process. I, I would, uh, I never could collect on the bet, but I bet <laughs> large sum of money that uh, in the fullness of time, we will understand that our ancestors, and was this 250,000 years ago or, or, or a million and a half years ago, there's a big window there. Much harder for them to learn to speak than it is for us. Okay. That, that we are born today with brains that have been streamlined for language learning mm -hmm. because it's been such a uh, valuable advantage. Uh, there's been plenty of selection pressure mm -hmm. for being uh, quick on the uptake on language. And language has evolved also to be easy to be taken up. I just want to move back yeah. to the sort of computer part of the question. So do you believe? Oh yeah, right. We, yeah. We that. <laughs> yeah. Do you believe that um, computers are going to be able to attain an ability to use human language in the way that humans do without having some kind of consciousness behind it? Um, no, they'd have to have consciousness, mm -hmm. but they can. In, in principle, they mm -hmm. can. Um, I think that. Uh, it's very important to realize they don't get, and, mm -hmm. and that just more of the same is not going to get us there. Right. Uh, so uh, the obvious uh, example for, uh, as the imagination uh, furnisher is Watson, mm -hmm. which uh, IBM's Watson, which uh, beat uh, Ken Jennings and that other fellow at Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And the, there's Watson speaking, and there's Watson answering questions. Um, no. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Uh, I mean, Watson is actually a very amazing uh, system. It's mm -hmm. uh, the more I learn about it, the more impressed I am with it. But the interface on that program mm -hmm. very, very tightly constrained and. Watson couldn't have a conversation with anybody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Uh, it can answer right. Jeopardy questions. Yeah. That's all of that sort it can do. So it's not general purpose. It's right. absolutely right. not general purpose. It would fail miserably on the Turing test. Yeah. And you say, well, all right, but it's a good beginning. Yeah, it is. It might be 2%. Mm -hmm. You know, what about the other 98%? Yeah. So um, we have a question from one of our viewers, Jeffrey, who wanted to ask you about um, this idea that you've had in the past that you've really been critical of, that um, we have some sort of like mental language that sort of the mind is like coded in the verb thought. Um, so what don't you like about this idea? Like mental ease or brainish? Uh, I guess I don't like anything about the idea. <laughs> uh, I think there's plenty of language in the mind. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's our native language. I think uh, uh, an awful lot of thinking is is in a sense talking to yourself. Talking mm -hmm. to yourself in French or English, whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. or maybe both. Uh, and, and also sometimes in maybe a sort of idiolect of your own devising, mm -hmm. uh, which might not even always have pronunciation. Uh, but that's not, the, that's not the language of thought hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or if it, actually I think the plausibility of that Mm -hmm. goes a long way to accounting for the spurious plausibility and popularity of the idea of the language of thought. Mm -hmm. um, is there a system of representation in brains? Yes, <laughs> I think there is. Is it language-like? Not much. Okay. Except when it's this Explicitly yourself. language. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, given that some of the ideas are particularly more complicated ideas, like um, in mathematics, seem to be more opaque to us when we don't sort of present them in, sort of in the framework of language, right? Like to explain them in this way, um, is there some sort of like infiltration, maybe, of like language into these sort of other realms of thinking? Do you oh, think? sure. I think. I mean. Uh, Mathematics is a good example. Um, uh, 
couldn't exist without language. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, as, a, as, a, as an inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the truths of arithmetic are, don't depend on human existence right. or on any mathematicians. But the articulation of those truths uh, in language, if you and if you include the symbolism of mathematics mm -hmm. as part of language, is uh, yeah, sure. So it just remains for me to thank you. So thanks a lot for oh, coming in with us today. We really welcome. appreciate it. Thanks for Enjoyed a very good conversation. You. Thanks. Interesting stuff, right? Thanks for watching, and we'll be back with a regular episode next week. See you then.